This morning we'll continue to study the book of the Acts of the Apostles as we look once more at the ongoing trials and tribulations of the Apostle Paul. We realize that since the last chapter through the rest of the book of Acts that Paul will no more experience freedom but will be as a prisoner for the rest of his life to the extent that we know it of these times. And so we need to continue our careful examination of his afflictions, his trials and tribulations as they're recorded under the supervision of God the Holy Spirit. This morning I'll be reading from Acts chapter 22, beginning at verse 22 through chapter 23, verse 10. And they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. And then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear, and brought Paul down and set him before them. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you to sit to judge me according to the law. And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out into the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. When he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, or no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel had spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him to the barracks. He was ears to hear the inspired, infallible Word of God. Let them hear it. Let us pray. Our Father, again, as through this Scripture we have the opportunity to eavesdrop, as it were, 
upon this moment in Paul's life and trial. We pray that the same Spirit that enabled him to speak with such boldness may make the truth of this text clear for us and for its application. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Just as it was the case in the trial of Jesus, he was brought before the Jews, before the Romans, and back and forth as they were trying to pass the buck, as it were. So we see now in these recent paragraphs that we've been reading in the book of Acts that Paul has had to defend himself before the Jews, now before the Romans, and then again before the Jews, and then again before the Romans. It's as though it's musical chairs with the life of the apostle Paul. But last week, after we listened to his defense where he recounted the occurrences of his conversion on the Damascus Road, and how later on in a trance Christ had appeared to him and spoken to him and verified his call as the apostle to the Gentiles, at the end of that defense, which was supposed to calm the crowd down, instead it incited them to even more hostility, and they began to scream, tear their garments, throw dust in the air like a bull ready to go on a rampage, saying, away with this man, we can't stand to let him live. Now, when the Roman commander saw all of this, he still was puzzled as to the cause of the depth of the hostility that had been manifested against Paul. So listen to what he commands his centurions and so to do. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they were so opposed to him. No longer was the commander satisfied simply to interrogate Paul, inquire of him what all the fuss was about. He said, I want to get to the bottom of this, prepare the scourge, tie him to the post, bear his back, and we'll ask him the questions we need to ask him under the whip. Now, you recall that we've seen already the manifold trials that Paul has had to endure with beatings and stoning and imprisonment and the rest, and how he had been beaten by the Jews on more than one occasion. But if you notice closely here, that at no time up till now was Paul ever subjected to the Roman form of scourging. Jesus had been scourged during His trial and immediately prior to His execution on the cross. The Roman scourging made use of the flagellum, which were leather thongs attached to the ends of which were metal pieces that when a victim was beat with this type of scourge, many times they died. And even if they didn't die, on every occasion, they were left with scars on their body for the rest of their lives. So it's that kind of torture, that kind of beating that now the commander is suggesting to be administered to Paul in order to get to the truth of the matter. And so as they prepare him for this whipping, Paul just mentions to the centurion who's there, is it lawful to do this to a Roman who has not been convicted of a crime? We'll see what happens. When the centurion heard that, he went right away, told the commander, saying, wait a minute, Be careful. Take care of what you do. This fellow's a Roman. The commander's thinking, oh, no, (laughs) I've got trouble. So he comes to Paul himself, and he says, tell me, are you a Roman? And Paul said, yes. Now the commander said, with a large sum I obtained this citizenship. 
Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Now, what's going on here? In the modern day, if you're born within the geographical boundaries of a particular nation, usually it carries with it the automatic status of citizenship. That was not the case in Rome. To be a citizen of the city of Rome was to be numbered among the elite. It was a high privilege accorded for the most part only to the patricians of the society. There were two ways, basically, that you could gain this citizenship if you didn't have it in a previous manner. One was if you had achieved some high level of service to the Roman Empire, or if you purchased it with a large sum of money. Now, we have to ask, you know, that since Paul was born a Roman citizen, this means obviously that his father or grandfather had previously gained citizenship, perhaps without ever setting foot in Rome, through one of those two means, either by offering some tremendous service or achievement for the Romans by which he was awarded this honor of citizenship, or by purchase that would indicate that Paul's father or grandfather had been extremely wealthy. There are other reasons to believe that Paul did come from a wealthy family, not the least of which was his ability to come to Jerusalem and study at the feet of Gamaliel, as we've already indicated. But we don't know for sure when the practice of purchasing citizenship began in the Roman Empire. We do know that under the reign of the Emperor Claudius, when Claudius was needing to fill the general coffers of which Julius Caesar had spoken or had had accomplished according to his funeral oration, we know that Claudius, in an attempt to raise money, sold citizenships to various wealthy individuals or whoever could gather enough money together to get that privilege. And here the commander said, hey, I paid a large sum of money to get my citizenship papers. Now, we don't know when he did it, but His name, if you'll see later on, his first name is Claudius, which gives us a hint to speculate that perhaps he purchased his recently under the reign of Claudius and took the name Claudius in gratitude for this citizenship and in order to honor the emperor of that day. Again, that's speculation. We don't know that for sure. But in any case, this man is impressed that Paul is a Roman citizen. Now, there are two things at stake here. On the one hand, if you punish a Roman citizen without due process according to Roman jurisprudence, those who meet out such punishment expose themselves to the death penalty. So had Claudius scourged Paul without a trial, he could have himself been executed. Secondly, if a prisoner at his trial claims to be a Roman citizen and is not a Roman citizen and shown to be not a Roman citizen, then that person can be put to death. This is how highly Roman citizenship was prized in this time of history. So the issue now of Paul's credentials as a Roman is very much at the fore in the discussion, but let's see what happens. Immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. He hadn't scourged him, but he'd already tied him up and hindered him to this degree, not knowing he was a Roman. He could get in trouble just for that. So Paul loosed him as fast as he could and said, now let's go back to the Jews. Let's bring the Jewish council here, the high priests and so on, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and let's get to the bottom of it. And so he commanded that Paul have his bonds taken away and to appear before the council of the Jews. So again, Paul addresses the council and he says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I don't know about you, 
But when I read that, I do a double take. I say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Paul, aren't you the fella who called yourself the chief of sinners? Aren't you the man who stood there holding the clothes of the people that killed Stephen? Aren't you the one who went from house to house dragging men and women from their homes and putting them in prison and having them executed? And you have the audacity to say that all of your days you have lived with a good conscience before God? Well, maybe there's some shorthand here. Maybe it's implied that, that Paul is speaking here in the context of his former address, and what he is simply meaning to suggest is, since my conversion, since I became a Christian, since Christ appeared to me, then ever since that day in the road to Damascus, I've already confessed to you what a vile man I was before that, but since that time, I have obeyed my conscience before God. Maybe that's all there is to it. I don't think so. Because remember, when Paul stood by at the execution of Stephen, and when Paul carried on his crusade to stamp out the Christians, his conscience was convinced that he was doing the right thing. Doesn't that remind us of Luther at the Diet of Worms? When he was commanded to say, Revoco, I recant, and he addressed the Emperor Charles and the delegation from Rome, he said, unless I'm convinced by sacred Scripture or by evident reason, I cannot recant. Then what did he say? For my conscience is held captive by the Word of God. And to act against conscience, Luther said, is neither right nor safe. I don't know whether you agree with the Reformer at that point, but I agree on all the things he said. I believe his conscience was held captive by the Word of God, and I agree with the principle that he expressed that to act against conscience is not right, certainly not safe. The Bible tells us that that which is not of faith is sin. We know that there are people who, because of the customs they've experienced, have been taught that X, Y, and Z are wrong and sinful, even though the Bible leaves you free at that point. And even though the act itself may not be a sin, if you think it's a sin, if your conscience is persuaded that it's evil, and you go ahead and do it, then you've sinned by doing something you were convinced was evil. That's a sin. On the other hand, we might say, well, I did a sin, but I was convinced it was right. Doesn't that excuse me? If I am totally convinced that a certain kind of activity is appropriate and just and virtuous, even though in God's sight it's a sin, my conscience has convinced me that it's not a sin, doesn't the fact that I acted according to conscience exonerate me? No. Not if your conscience has been dulled and distorted and calloused by repeating and rep rep repetitive sin and by a slothful neglect of the Word of God, which is what is supposed to capture our consciences? I don't know everybody in this room, but I know this, that everybody in this room has had their conscience influenced by things apart from God, for better or for worse. And we have a tendency in our culture to live not by the mandates of Scripture, but by the theology of what I call Jiminy Cricket theology that says, let your conscience be your guide. Well, if you commit sin in good conscience, it's still sin. 
When I started taking violin lessons from the master or mistress of the violin, Olga, and I would come to my lesson and she'd say, did you practice this week? I'd say, oh yes, teacher. But she wouldn't take my word for it. She'd take my hand and she'd run her fingers across the tips of my fingers to see if they were calloused. If they were calloused, then she said, okay, you were practicing. If they weren't callous, she said, you're not telling me the truth. But you see, we get callous from repeated practice. First time we commit a sin, we may abhor ourselves. We may be stricken with a guilty conscience. We do it again, and the conscience is less strident. We do it again and again and again and again until we can do it with feeling no remorse at all. And we live in a culture that has lost its conscience. We are like the people that Jeremiah described who had the forehead of the harlot who had lost her capacity to blush. We live in a culture that practices sin day after day after day, and nobody says anything about it. So we better be careful that if and when we follow our consciences, we're following consciences that have been informed by the Word of God. Paul said this, the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. So they strike Paul in the mouth, and Paul responds, he says, God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Not a very Christian response, is it? (laughs) Sounds like Jesus talking to the Pharisees. They were whitewashed tombs on the outside, beautiful, clean, pure, on the inside, filled with dead men's bones. So Paul rebukes the high priest for his hypocrisy. You have me on trial here for disobeying the law, you who are the guardians of the law, and you're slapping me without a trial? Haven't you read Leviticus? And you've just violated, they just violated Roman law across the street, now you're violating Jewish law. Somebody heard Paul say that. He said, hey, 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 do you know who you're talking to? You can't revile the high priest like that. That's God's high priest. Now, again, Paul says something very puzzling. He says, I didn't know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. He said, I know it's wrong to speak evil about our spiritual leaders, and that's a principle, by the way, folks, that hasn't ever been abrogated. So be careful what you say at me at dinner today. (laughs) Paul said, I didn't know he was the high priest. Well, how do we understand that? How could he not know who it was that said that? Again, you go through church history and you can't believe the gymnastics that scholars have gone through to try to get Paul out of this pickle for speaking so harshly against the high priest and then saying he didn't know he was the high priest. One excuse is that because Paul was troubled with his vision, apparently, as he said later on, he writes with such large letters and so on, that maybe because of his myopia, he saw this group in front of him, but he couldn't distinguish between those who were speaking to him. And when he spoke out against the one who had just talked, he didn't realize that he was lashing out against the high priest. That's possible. Others exonerate Paul by saying, well, he'd been away from Jerusalem for 20 years, and he came back. He'd heard about Ananias, but didn't recognize him, never seen him before. Others argue that, according to Josephus, it wasn't even Ananias who was the high priest at this time, and so there was some confusion in the crowd there about who this Ananias really was. And another option, which is somewhat imaginative, is that Paul was speaking ironically really sticking the knife into Ananias. Oh, you're the high priest. 
How was I to know? Never thought the high priest would order a prisoner to be slapped without due process. And so he's saying, I didn't really recognize the truth of the claim to high priesthood. Maybe that's what… I don't know. I'll let you figure it out. But when Paul perceived that part of the group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, and he knew that these two parties of the Jews were at war with each other all the time, doctrinally and theologically, it's almost like today, if you're a Christian. We see that liberals, neo-Orthodox people can get along with each other because they don't care about truth. And as much as they debate with each other over other things, they'll close ranks if anybody orthodox stands up. Because one thing we know for sure that everybody hates orthodoxy. And that's kind of what was going on here. You have the two parties of the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were traditional adversaries, but they come together in a common bond to stop the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Paul was nobody's fool. He knew the most ancient stratagem there was in warfare. You divide and conquer. He says, you maybe started this meeting because you thought I took somebody into the temple or the other charges. He said, but really, what's behind all of this is that I am a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul understood that, that the foundation of everything he taught was based on the resurrection. As he said to the Corinthians, if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain. We're wasting our time. We're no different than the Mohammeds, you know, Mohammed who's dead and Buddha who's dead and, and Confucius who's dead and Moses who's dead. The whole truth claim of Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection. And really what's gotten me in trouble with you folks is that I'm preaching the resurrection of Christ because I'm a Pharisee, son of the Pharisee. I believe in life after death. All of a sudden, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection, didn't believe in life after death. The Pharisees did. And so all of a sudden, instead of being on, on Paul, they're at each other's throats. And one of the Pharisees says, hey, this man hasn't done anything wrong. He's on our side. Maybe he has talked to a spirit. Maybe he is anointed by God. And so the dissension now becomes so riotous that the Romans said, hey, I've had enough of this. Bring Paul back to the barracks, and we'll deal with the matter. And so again, Paul has been faithful to the resurrection of Christ. Christ. 